Y presentaron era Blind Date con Fred. Nos um, encontramos en agosto y nos casamos en septiembre, septiembre, seis semanas. Porque se, um, el, la guerra se acabó en este mes de agosto en uh, 1945. Así es que nos casamos allá y yo no volví a, a la universidad, no volví a, los, a, a, a California. Um, fui con él. Pero me dijo él, antes de casarnos, que, uh, que él tenía la intención de vivir en los mochis. Me dijo él que si yo quería casar con él, este, que teníamos que vivir en México. Y mi mamá vino a, a la boda. Mi papá no pudo porque era guerra y no, no pudieron viajar muy bien. Así es que él quedó en California, pero mi mamá fue a, a la boda, vino a la boda y estaba allá tres días y lloró los tres días. Todos los tres días lloró en la boda porque ella no conoció a Fred y ella pensaba que yo estaba haciendo una equivocación muy grande de vivir en México y que ella nunca iba a vivir, no, nunca ve, a verme otra vez, a visitar ni nada. Pero salió bien <laughs> todo. He wanted to go back to finish school. And um, so we lived back there for two years while he was studying to work at the sugar company. He took a business course. And then he took me down to Mexico. Los Mochis, Los Mochis Sinaloa. Y um, mis, my mother-in-law and father-in-law lived there. And they helped me get, it, it, was, it was not hard for me to go to Los Mochis. I was looking forward to it and enjoyed it. And they helped me get used to the mercado and how to do my marketing and where to go and where to live. And um, I made a lot of friends. Then we had piñatas for, the, for all the birthdays and what I loved, everybody came. The, the grandmas, the babies, nobody, everybody was invited when, and we just put chairs out in the yard. And uh, when we had our children's birthdays or when we went to their friends' parties. I remember the stories they tell about when my father-in-law went down in 1913. Do you want to hear about that? Mr. Johnston wanted to hire men to work for him. And um, he went to Massachusetts. He had a man friend there. And so he went there to that university. And he wanted to interview men, who, uh, students who had studied Spanish and agriculture. I don't know why my father-in-law studied Spanish in Massachusetts but he did, which was wonderful that he happened to study that language. So five men were interested. Mr. Johnson invited them to go down to Los Mochis and look at the company and look at all the sugar cane that was being grown and see if they wanted to work there. So they went down and visited. I think it must have been their Christmas vacation. They were still in college and they went down and they all wanted to go back and be hired. So five of them, after they graduated from college, five of them got on the train in Boston and went on the train to San Francisco. When this is <clears throat> after they graduated, they'd already made the visit and they knew they wanted to go down there. 
When they got to San Francisco, one of the five men got cold feet and he would not get off the train. I mean, he got off the train, but he went back home. So there were four men. Then they got on a boat to go to Topolabampo. Topolabampo. They got on the boat and they went down around Baja and up in the Gulf of California and got to Topolabampo. One of the other men wouldn't get off. He got nervous. So he would not get off the boat. So that left three of them. Um, and other three, two of them stayed all of their lives. They loved Mexico. One was Miller Jordan. He lived there in Los Mochis. And I knew him and I knew his wife and his children. We had, by the time I got down there, there might have been eight American families. They were all older than me. One story I remember very clearly, I heard them tell, I heard my father-in-law tell, that <clears throat> during the Mexican Revolution, when he was down there, the Me one time the Indians came in and were marauding and burning the, the town, burning Los Mochis. And my father-in-law, and I think it was Mr. Edmonds, I think it was Clarence Edmonds, my father-in-law and another man ran out of the town, the other side of town, and hid in the cane fields until the Indians finished. And at that time, the Indians burned Mr. Edmonds' house to the ground. And at that time, Mr. Edmonds was married to Myrtle and had just, Myrtle was a new bride. And she had what we, what we called, um, what do you call it? What the women have? All of their clothes and their bedding and their, all, anyway, she- Her dowry? Her dowry. She brought all of her, her linens that she had worked on as a young girl. They burned all of her clothes and all of her linens. Yes. So, yeah. that and that was um, during the Mexican Revolution. Then my father-in-law worked for the company several years. Then he was made to join the army because World War I had happened in the United States. So he had to go into the army. And he was in the cavalry and he was stationed in the United States, down south. When he was on leave, he went back to his home in Massachusetts and met Rita. And they didn't see each other many times. He met her, they corresponded by mail while he was in the army. Then he went back to Los Mochis to work after he got out of the army. And he still corresponded with Rita and they were married when World War I ended. She was a school teacher, like about 28 years old. She had never been out of the state of Massachusetts. She came from a very humble family. Her father was a barber. Her, her father and mother put four children through college on a barber's salary. And so she went to college and she had become a teacher when she went down to Los Mochis. And she didn't speak Spanish. So she taught herself Spanish and she loved Mexico. She lived there the rest of, well, until my father-in-law died. Then she moved back to Massachusetts. Then I became close friends with Henry's wife, um, Berta. And um, she and I were very close friends and she and I went, we had a fun relationship. Berta Ruiz, during the Mexican Revolution, her family sent her out to San Francisco, to Dominican, it's, it's some kind of a, of a college. I don't know if it was a high school or a college. So Berta learned Spanish, learned English very well and loved to read in English. She was very well educated. So Berta and I being good friends, we would go to the market together almost every day. We'd call, she'd call me and pick me up or I'd call her and pick her up. And, um, 
we would be in the market together and we found out that if she talked in Spanish and I talked in English, we could express ourselves better. Um, she could understand me perfectly and I could understand her perfectly, but we could use our own language that easier. And people around us would all just stop and listen and wonder what we were doing. But that was our, that was our way of communicating. Yeah, she was a good friend. Sometimes when we found out that the cane fields were gonna be burned that night, we would pile the children in the car and take a ride to where they were burning the sugar cane. And that was quite a sight at night with a dark night and the fire burning off the cane. And the cane cutters telling about when they burned the cane and the cane cutters were just covered with that black ash or soot to get all the uh, leaves off of the cane so they could, could cut it. Mm -hmm. When Fred was a little boy, he had a horse and he would go out into the fields. He'd get up real early in the morning and the field uh, manager was very kind to him and made him feel like he was part of the crew. I don't know. He was very young. And they even put his name on the roll call in the morning. So he would go out with the workers and he, he loved to be involved. That was before he went away to school. So when he, when he had his education, it was definitely with the thought of coming back and working for the sugar company. That's all he ever wanted to do. When he came back, he started off at the bottom. I don't know what his job was, but um, it wasn't in the office. It was out in the fields. And he loved it. He thrived on it. So little by little, he learned the business from the ground up. And when his father was president, then pretty soon Fred became vice president. And when we were in our 30s, he was going to be president. That was, uh, that, and I thought that we would live there our whole lives. Then when the company was sold, my understanding was that um, Science, the man who, and I don't know if he's a general, he was a general, but I don't know whether to address him as general Science. When he owned a lot of, I, my understanding is he owned many sugar companies in, in the whole country in Mexico, and he wanted a monopoly on the sugar company. And this is what I was told. And so he offered to buy the United Sugar Company and he made an offer that was very high and could not be turned down. So the main shareholders decided to sell because the company was thriving. And it was what they thought, well, if it's, while it's worth this much, we better take advantage of it. And they did. This happened in my life. It happened unexpectedly, very quickly, that suddenly we lost our home, our friends. My husband lost his livelihood that meant so much to him. And we, we had to move away. My poor children didn't get to say goodbye to their friends. It happened while they were, we, we were out in summer vacation. So Andy never got to say goodbye to Carlitos. Um, I didn't realize how cruel it was. It happened so, I was so caught up with trying to move <clears throat> and settle my family in California again. And then it was very hard. When I moved down to Mexico, it was easy. It was fun. I didn't have culture shock. When I came back to California, I had culture shock. It was so different. The life was so much faster and so superficial. And Mexico was so real. 
Los Mochis. It was it was real life in my mind. And uh, I, I didn't want to leave. None of us wanted to leave. We wanted to stay there, but we couldn't. So, um, and so he never, my husband never became president. And um, he had a whole year looking for what to do now, where to turn. And he finally bought another company, um, Rock, Sand, and Gravel. He liked, what he liked about his work at, in Los Mochis was the huge amount of sugarcane that would come into the factory. He loved to see those train loads of, and some of the trains were pulled by mules. And he, he used to go out and, and have something to do with raising the mules even at that time. But every, every phase of the sugar production was interesting to him. And the men he was surrounded with were very top-notch, intelligent men. Zamora and Garza and, um, um, of course, Licenciado Gastelum. In fact, Fred worked for Gastelum at one time, but one time Jack Steele was his boss. Most of the time, I think that Mr. Steele was, was his boss. Mr. Jack Steele, of course, was born in Scotland. He was not an American. Scotland. He was born in Glasgow. Glasgow. Glasgow, Scotland. And he talked with a, with a Scottish brogue. We would go to their home for, for dinner, for beautiful, beautifully presented dinners, maybe, maybe a dozen of us. And he would greet us at the door and he'd say, sit ye doon, sit ye doon, to sit down. That was his, his uh, way of talking was very, very much a brogue. Talking about those dinner parties, we did get in on some of the parties at the big house when the, because Mrs. Johnston, when I went down there, Mrs. Johnston was a widow. I never knew Mr. Johnston. She was a widow who lived in New York, a very wealthy widow who lived on Park Avenue in New York. And she would come down and she would bring a friend, a woman friend, and they would spend a month at the big house and they would give parties. And when they had a dinner parties, they would have a um, butler standing at one end of the table and another butler, men, stand at the other end of the table ready to serve. And they would serve things like like a whole duck with the whole head and everything. Things that were hard for me to eat. Some of the some of the things were very, I can't remember what they were very exotic. Um, and then we would play bridge afterwards. <clears throat> and I remember um, we'd dress up, we'd wear long dresses and tuxedos. It was it was elegant at that time. The, the life was very elegant. Um, the next day, my friend Berta Ruiz, she had been at the party too. And I said, did you see? Oh, no, she asked me, Berta said, did you see Mrs. Johnston's jewelry? And I said, oh yes, wasn't it pretty? And she said, those were real. They were real diamonds and rubies and sapphires and emeralds. And I thought I had, I had fake ones and I had uh, crystal and, and you know, just, my diamond was real, but the rest was not. And I, I remember, I wish I'd looked at them and realized they were real jewels. Um, then Gwen Tandy, when she was married to Charles Tander, Tandy of the um, Tandy Leather, uh, they would come down and visit Mrs. Johnston, who was her mother-in-law, and we would go out. I remember we went to the Chapman Hotel for dinner. And they did a funny thing. There were about 20 of us sitting around and just having drinks and being relaxed. <clears throat> and the men had hats. And one of the men 
put his hat out and said, everybody put a ring or something in here. Why, I don't know. They were just being silly to pay for the dinner. So everybody put, I mean, they actually put their diamonds and everything in this. Well, when it came around to me afterwards, then we were supposed to retrieve our ring. Gwen Johnston had put her ring in there. It was a little finger ring with diamonds and sapphires. And I picked it up and I said, oh, Gwen, she was sitting next to me. I said, this is beautiful. And she said, it's yours. She wouldn't take it. And I didn't want to take it. But she made me put it on. And she said, with one condition, you always wear it on your little finger. And I'd never put a, fing a ring on my little finger. Well, and I got my own ring back. And that was that. The next day, I went to visit at the big house, Mrs. Johnston and Gwen, and I went with a ring to return it and said, I know that was a lot of fun, but here I want to give you your ring back and thank you. She never would take it. She made me keep it. And I still have it. At Easter vacation, we used to take the children, Fred and I did, and we there was a company boat that we would, a nice boat that we would take over to Santa Maria Island and Fred and the children would put up a tent and uh, I would sleep on the boat, but they would sleep on cots on the sand. And we used to catch crabs and we'd put them in a pail and cook them and eat them for dinner right then. And then we could go water skiing. It was a paradise. And on our side where we camped, on our side of the island, it was calm, and then we would walk over to the other side of the island, and it was waves. So it was fun to swim. And the water was beautiful. There was wonderful fish. It was, it was a haven. So that was my children's memories. And we would cook. We just put down little stones and put our pot on the stone and, and cooked very simple meals. One time, uh, Melinda took her friend Hortensia Garza, and Tensha brought a little sack with some food that she would eat. And apparently, the food that we served wasn't something she was used to. So she ate her beans and her tortillas every day while we were having these things like crabs. And I wonder if she remembers that. And of course the children were in the water a lot and I was too. But there were these little gnats. That was the only bad thing about that and especially at night. And they didn't mind. The uh, Fred and the children slept on the, on the sand under this car. It was just a canvas top. It wasn't really a tent. He'd put four poles. It was very crude. But um, we all loved it, and um, as I say, I got away from those hennies. I remember that the first um, year that we were down there, there was a bad hurricane, and we didn't live in the house at that time that we ended up in. We lived in closer to the, it was in the uh, compound, but it was near the office. Anyway, it was when Los Mochis had a flood and it rained and rained for days. And we got some uh, sandbags and our house had steps that went up and then came down when we, it was sort of like a little dam to get in the front door. So Fred went and got sandbags. We could see the rain was making flood and he started putting them around at the bottom of the stairs. And the rain, all of a sudden, all of the land was saturated. And it was like filling a bathtub. Uh, there, was, they, there was no place for the water to go. I think we were on the low side of Los Mochis. I think the water came toward the company office. And all of a sudden, the water just started rising 
and it came all the way up to this level and went in our house. And it was up to my hips in the house. And we had two babies and it was getting to be nighttime. And I took Eric, who was a little baby, and Fred took Melinda in our arms and we had to leave. We had to go find higher ground. So we went out of our house and we walked in the street beside the canal. And we walked like two blocks and the water was, I put some shorts over my skirt and the water came up to my shorts. And the water was dirty, the flood water. And if we had dropped our babies, we couldn't have found them. It was, it was so treacherous. We walked two blocks to the Goodrich's house and they were, it was all in the compound that, next to the company and that was, had a, a fence around it. The, com, the Goodrich's lived about a little bit higher than we did. And we got to their house. By then it was nighttime and Margaret and George Goodrich were standing on their screen porch with lanterns because there was no electricity. And they held the candles and the lanterns. And Fred said, you wait here with Eric and I'll take Melinda and I'll come back for you. So I was standing in front of their house and he had to walk across their yard and I could see him in the silhouette as he was walking toward the Goodriches and all of a sudden he disappeared. <clears throat> they had had the plumber that day who dug a trench in front of their house and he fell into it. And I was watching him and he just disappeared. Well, he got himself up and kept on walking and he came back and he got me with my baby and got me there. We stayed with them one week and the engineers from the company went to everybody's house that was flooded and for days they had pumps and we could see water coming out out of the windows. They pumped the water out and had to get, because there was no way to get it out without pumping it. You couldn't sweep it out because of the way the houses, the entrance was built. And when they finally got all the water out of our house, then we had to go in and clean it and there were frogs and trash. But that was a bad hurricane in the, in the uh, fall. Eric was a baby. Eric was born in 1948. So that's like me. Mm -hmm. Mel Melinda was born in 46. And Eric was born in 48 and he was a baby. And it, that was uh, one summer that we spent there. And the summers were awfully hot. They were really, really hot. I suppose they're still hot. Yeah. But the winters in Mexico, we'd get up and we'd put a sweater on. And then at, uh, by noontime, we could take the sweater off because winter was just perfect weather, beautiful weather. I can't say enough about how we loved our Mexican friends. And I always felt, I never felt any discrimination. I never had any example of anybody not liking us as Americans. We were made to feel very welcome and loved. So that might be why it's hard for me to understand that somebody didn't like us. But all my years there, I was there 15 years, and we just, we just felt like we belonged. And of course, my parents-in-law did belong. They'd been there forever. They'd, they'd been there longer than most of them before the Mexicans that we knew were born. Um, and by the time I left, I felt like I was a native. I was from Los Mochis. I didn't have a permanent house anyplace else. That was our home. And my children certainly felt that way even more than I did because they didn't know anything else. But I loved my friends. 
I did. And I and the people that worked for us, they were lovely, lovely people. I, I hope I always treated them with respect and they treated me that way. Yeah. I used to drink the water from the canal and the gardener would bring a bucket. That poor gardener, we really worked him hard. He was always bringing buckets of water from the canal, either for the laundress or for us to drink. And we had in our back porch, we had an olla that was uh, pumice, I believe, and it stood about that high. And the gardener would pour the water in that and it would drip, 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 one at a time into another olla. That water was wonderful water. It was pure and it cleaned at a, of course that was from the Forte River originally. So it was clean water. And that's what we drank for the 15 years that I was there. I wish I had it today. That's it. <laughs>